Welcome to the November 2021 and February 2022 strategic case study with SEMA. We're going to be um, walking through this case study together in this video. We're going to read it through and discuss the case from the perspective of business and commercial issues. We're going to look at the issues that the business is facing um, and how those issues might translate into what the examiner may focus on in the exam. Our approach uh, is in, through this series of videos is to go through the case three more times after this one read through. One for each OT paper. So we've got E3 first, then P3, and then F3. Remember though, don't become too obsessed with the pre-scene. The pre-scene is there to level the playing field between the students. You'll be given some unseen information on the day that is normally um, most influential in the questions that are asked. So the pre-scene is important, of course it is. It sets the scene, gives us an indication about what the case is about, but please don't become too obsessed with the pre-scene. Um, we're going to get on to question practice as, as quickly as we possibly can um, to get you practice um, on cases with some new unseen information to make sure that you can um, adapt and respond to that unseen information on the day. Okay, so what we're going to do is have a read through a page at a time and we'll think together about what the commercial and business issues are that we're facing. And then, as I said earlier, in later videos, we'll then go through E3, P3 and F3 perspectives. So we are pixel whiz here. First thing I can see, fourth word in, we are quoted. So as a quoted company, we're listed on a stock exchange. That means we've got shareholders that we need to keep happy. And how do we keep shareholders happy? Giving them a, re a decent return uh, for the amount of risk that they take on for their investment. And quite often, Stock exchanges are relatively short term in focus, so they want growth year on year. So that's the number one thing I think of here. We need to create growth year on year. Um, we also have to abide by corporate governance regulations if we're a, a listed company. So best practice on a complier explain basis, typically. Um, we will need to think about that when we get to the corporate governance uh, information provided to us. Uh, the stock exchange, of course, is also a source of finance. So if we're looking to expand and we need to raise significant funds, we could issue some shares through the stock exchange because we're already listed, or maybe even some debentures if we want to issue some debt finance. So there's a ready source of finance there, but there's always a danger as well that we could be taken over um, if someone else um, buys a significant proportion of our shares. I suppose the last thing to say about sources of finance and the stock exchange is that, of course, we could acquire other people um, through things like share for share exchanges. That's always a possibility. So we're a quoted company that we create and sell video games. So we're not a real manufacturing business in that sense. We are service orientated. A video games company is going to be um, very people orientated and dependent upon the people that work there for the creation of value. Um, also, um, it springs to mind ideas of capitalizing development costs and how we amortize those for a video game, given that we might not know what the life of that game is, is likely to be. So there's a few issues that spin around uh, the nature of the industry, high tech as well. Also, video games, fundamentally being IT based, um, springs you know, straight to the fore. Things like cybersecurity concerns, maybe potential for big data and gathering information um, automatically and electronically to help inform our business decisions going forwards. So, you know, you can get quite a lot of information out of the first sentence, really, there. PixelWiz generates revenue streams from its games in several different ways. Okay, so we're a senior manager um, in the finance function. So we work in finance and we report directly to the board and advise on special projects and strategic matters. So we're aiming this at board level, uh, as you'd expect at this level in, um, in the qualification. We're based in Westland. So Westland is our home country. It's developed, uh, it's got an active and well-regulated stock exchange. Um, so we are 
probably in a relatively high cost location then in that case. Um, there's our currency, the Westland dollar, and we need to report using IFRS. OK. Let's have a look at the video games industry. Uh, as an industry, it seems to be uh, successful. Look at that for a, a, a growth path. It's consistent. Only seems to be heading fairly consistently in one direction. So growth is there. On the face of it, that's a good thing. You know, overall, it's not like our industry is in um, decline. Um, however, it will mean that with a growth like that, you know, that's only over a what's that a nine year period? We've tripled um, revenues in a nine year period globally. That's going to attract competition. Um, so it's going to be a tough marketplace um, because of that long standing and continual growth. So we've got 2.7 billion video gamers worldwide. That's a high proportion of the globe, folks. So um, it's a very big market. Just over half are male. The average age of gamers is 34 years, but there's a wide dispersion around that. So when you look at video gamers by age, I sort of look at that graph and think, well, all that's telling me is pretty much everybody plays video games. You know, I appreciate there's a big chunk that's 18 to 35, but it's not a small chunk that's below 18 or even more than 50. So it's um, any age. And the fact that it's only just over half male suggests it's sort of any age, any gender, really. So we come pretty close to saying anybody and everybody plays um, plays video games. Now, um, by type, uh, type of device... Smartphones, pretty popular. Um, I suppose that's because um, you know, so many people have a smartphone. And then we have games, consoles, and PCs, um, pretty big after that. And then we've got a few other things. So we've got handheld consoles there, pretty big, um, just falling just behind games and games, consoles, and PCs. And then we have um, tablets, smart TVs and virtual reality, augmented reality, where you might need some hardware, a headset to um, to be able to see things in 3D. So that's relatively minor, but as we'll see later, is a big growth area. So that's what we're looking at by um, type of device. So, there, so um, there's lots of devices that our games need to be compatible with. And you know what springs to my mind, and this won't be for the first time in this um, in this case study, is an ecosystem. So we have um, a lot of different hardware. We couldn't hope as a games manufacturer, to, for example, um, to manufacture uh, all that different hardware. We have to work with those guys as part of our ego, uh, ecosystem. So... Um, there is some description in um, the pre-scene about what those different things are, just in case you don't know. You know, games, consoles, dedicated devices that you connect to your television typically, and you either download games or, or load them from physical media like a DVD um, or a cartridge. Increasingly, we're seeing downloads there. 